episode of Here Come the Irish. Ryan Harris sporting his Notre Dame gear. I'm Dick Lombardi when are, with mine. When are they, when are they going to uh, put a video of us working out before the show? You know what I mean? Like you doing a sled pull and push oh. with your shirt off. And when are we know, doing that? It always cracks me up. You athletes, because you know we're all athletes at some level in our lives. But professional athletes today, there's never a day that goes by where I don't see a video from – just grinding, man, doing the work, doing the grind, <laughs> showing people working out. And I feel like, uh, say, well, isn't that your job, Ryan? Shouldn't you be yeah. grinding in the weight room? You should be. You should be. And, and it's weird. I'm glad I got out of the uh, weight room before the inter- the Instagram age because these cats working out and using the phone. <laughs> what is that, man? I just, I come on. At be dedicated point? to your craft. That's a good point. At what point during, uh, I don't know, during lunges or squats, do you say, okay, hold on a second. Get this angle real quick. <laughs> you know what? We need to find it. You and I, we're going to hit the gym when this COVID's over. We're going to get that We're gonna get that pre-show going. Yeah. Hey, man. Well, welcome to the show. Here come the Irish. We do this on a weekly basis. Uh, we talk about uh, last week's game, the up- upcoming opponent. We visit with uh, famous Notre Dame alumni. I, I believe you have former Notre Dame quarterback Terry Hanratty later in the show today, correct? That's right. The legend himself on Time Magazine, too. Wow. That's awesome. Well, uh, well, we'll also chat with a couple of writers from the Notre Dame Observer, get their thoughts on the upcoming opponent. And, of course, Vic's Picks, uh, which is uh, the ever-popular. Uh, here's the problem, though. Last week, nobody beat me. Uh, mm-hmm. I was undefeated last week in Vic's Picks. Nobody wins – a sweatshirt like the one you're wearing right now. Yeah, it's too bad. I mean, a lot of people lost last week with the, with the Irish, but the Irish got the W. There are no ugly yeah. Ws, no ugly wins or wives. That's the rule in sports. 4-0 and o is 4-0, and o, and I'd like to add that the Irish are undefeated ever since we've been doing this show, so there's a lot to be said there. Uh, first of all, you saw the, uh, the latest rankings. Number three in the country. How do you, who played the game, how do you, how do you look at rankings this early, especially since a couple conferences haven't even kicked off yet? Do they matter as much as people think they do? You know, you're definitely aware of it as a player. You know, it affects how quick you come back from injury. It affects the focus, and, and it really does affect recruiting. And that way, it really affects a program. You know, right now, Coach Kelly is able to call recruits, hey, Vic Lombardi, we're number three in the nation. I think we could be number one if you were on our team. We really need you next year. It's a lot different than saying, hey, we're 17th in the nation and we can get into the top 10 without – we get you on our, our, our team. So it affects everything in terms of a program standpoint. But from what the players do day to day, it does not matter. You're at Notre Dame to win a championship, and that doesn't matter. That doesn't change no matter what your ranking is. Well, it's still nice to see, though. I mean, anytime you oh, see number yeah. three, you got a single digit like that next to your name. And every week that – that ranking is going to be challenged. This week is no different. The ACC schedule continues. You know, what's what's crazy about this game is I looked at the Pitt Panthers. They played six games already. Um, they've yeah. already gone through six. They've lost the last three in a row. But isn't it interesting how some of these teams have already played what seems like a full schedule? Others are still just trying to get down. Especially when the Big Ten's looking to play eight games, you yeah. know. So uh, almost a full season, almost a full Corona-Rona season right now for the Pittsburgh Panthers, but a tough team that really challenged Notre Dame last year. Uh, so it'll be fun to go down back to the place where Vic, my first start at Notre Dame uh, was with Julius Jones. And we set the rushing record 222 yards for double deuce himself, Julius Jones. And then, Oh, by the way, that's where I ended my career as a Pittsburgh Steeler. My last play is against the Kansas city chiefs, a former team of mine before I went to have, Five surgeries to save my knee, my leg below my knee. So a really interesting place, Pittsburgh, in my life. That's crazy. So did you play in college at the old Pitt Stadium? Because this no, we, was at Heinz Field. Yeah, Heinz Field. Nope. Our first, My first game starting was at Heinz Field. And I'll never forget, uh, Coach Willingham would always bring us to the field of wherever we were playing so we could see the game clocks and things like that. So we walked out on the field. And, and this is back in the day, too, Vic, where guys didn't even have iPods yet. You know, there are a lot of disc men walking around and yeah. stuff like that. And I was walking back off the field, and my O-line coach was standing there, Coach Denbrock. And he goes, hey, will you feel good? I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, good, because you're going to start tomorrow. I was like, okay. <laughs> so it was just this awesome moment. And to have the success we had, to play with Julius Jones, uh, Jim Molinero, and, and all kinds of just greats, Ryan Grant. 
it really started for me in Pittsburgh, and I really won the respect of my teammates there. Got to feel special being a graduate of offensive line U, which is what I'm That's right. Was. Hey, uh, tell us about the uh, – you played four home games. I mean, you've had the same routine four times in a row at home. This will be Notre Dame's first road game. How was that adjustment? Well, it's fantastic. Players love away games, uh, and I even love them still as a broadcaster, right, because you get away from it all. You know, Vic, you and I, were on, we're on the Irish, and, hey, we go back to our dorms. I go to Siegfried Hall, Hall of Champions, and, and you go back to wherever it is that, that you stayed uh, back in the day. Sure. And, you're sit- and, and you're sitting there at Soren, Father Soren, great play, man, by the way, last year. Got to see mm-hmm. that. But you're sitting there and you're, are you resting or you see that, you know, science or psychology book on there and you're like, well, maybe I could read a little bit. But when you're on a plane on the road, one, you get to see a new city and there are a few entrances to the city like Pittsburgh. You go through this tunnel and you you get on the other side and there's downtown Pittsburgh for you. But there's so much time with your teammates. It's so hard to replicate anywhere else. So road games are really great for focus. Usually coaches want to have a home game, then a road game right away to really build that team component, have some fun, throw Gatorade bottles at each other, and, and get a win. But you build in a disadvantage when you're a fan and you're seeing Notre Dame's on the road. Uh-oh, it's a road game. You know, that's how you think of road games. Do, do, do players even think that way? Not at Notre Dame because every stadium we go to is packed full of Notre yeah. Dame fans unless we're in the SEC, you yeah. know. So it's another example. What you do learn as a player when you have an away game is you learn how broad the Notre Dame support is how broad the Notre Dame family goes. There are going to be people in Pittsburgh. There are going to be people in Charlotte, you know, and there's just all these Irish fans. And for a lot of people, we forget a lot of these kids, the first time they left their hometown, right? They left their hometown to go to Notre Dame and that's where they've been, especially freshmen. And all of a sudden you're going to go to Pittsburgh and there's a whole family of Irish in Pittsburgh. Well, are there in LA? And so you start realizing how big we actually are as an alumni. Okay, the defense, the Notre Dame defense has held its own, all right? They've done wonders the last few weeks. Fair to say now, offensively, they got to pick it up, especially on the road. They're going to get tested. People have film, obviously. They know the tendencies. Notre Dame's offense has to get going. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Ian Book didn't have a touchdown pass last week, and they still won the game. But it's tough when you see Clemson and and Trevor Lawrence has five touchdowns in the first half. That was a you know, and, and so there is a school of thought of let's not give away what we're good at for our opponents to study. And another school of thought is we're going to do what we do, get confidence in doing it and make people stop us. And I'm much more to that latter kind of mentality. And hopefully Notre Dame starts to do that this week against Pittsburgh. And Ian Book running the football is a big piece of the Irish success offensively. Yeah. One of the reasons no one beat me in Vic's picks last week is because everybody predicted 500 yards of total offense, 450 and all that. I think I was the only one who had it somewhere in the 300s, and that's exactly where the Irish fell. Um, The passing game, the explosive plays, easier said than done. How do you manufacture those? Well, you got to really let people know ahead of time that that's where you're going to go. Hey, we're going to have this play, uh, uh, the second play of the game. Or here are the three plays that we're really going to target. But it's also on Javon McKinley and Ben Skoranek, who Ben Skoranek had a career-high two catches at Notre Dame yet last week. Those two have to get going. You know, you have Kevin Austin as well, who I'm really looking forward to him continuing to perform, and then Braden Lindsey. Those, receiv- those receivers, they have to step it up. Just take a look at Alabama last year. They had two wide receivers go in the top 15. That's the kind of talent eventually you're going to go against when you play at Clemson. When you play in Alabama in the college football playoffs, and you have to have weapons yourself to get the job done. You know what? I can't wait to see here how the big fellas up front operate in this game. Notre Dame ranked number seven in the country in rushing offense. We know Notre Dame can run the ball. Well, Pitt is number one in rush defense. This is great versus great. Something's got to give here. Yeah, absolutely. But the strength of Pittsburgh's defense, and we'll talk with Aiden Thomas of the Observer in a little bit, is really their edge players. and that One of their players leads college football with seven sacks already. He's a dynamic player. Reminds me of Ziggy Ansa, a player who used to play uh, for the Lions, and he will be a, a first-day pick uh, for the NFL. Now, they also haven't played a lot of talented teams, and that middle of the defense is wide open for some runs, and that's where Aaron Banks, Tommy Kramer get to work. One common opponent that I see on the schedules, and that's uh, that's Louisville, obviously. Uh, the, the Irish 
uh, barely get by Louisville, and uh, Pitt beat Louisville almost a similar type of game, low scoring 23-20. Anything to glean from that comparison? Well, I, I, you really can't because Louisville played the best game of their life against Notre Dame last week. They had 11 turnovers coming into the game. They didn't have one last week, and they really were able to find some ground running the football. They were doing things that they'd never done when I watched film, and sometimes you have those games when you're Notre Dame. I remember that was that was against UCLA my senior year in 2006. They came to Notre Dame. That, I think they had a losing record at the time, and we ended up winning on a last play touchdown pass to Jeff Samarja. So those things happen. You have to gain confidence even in a tight win like that, and you have to start producing and realizing how important the details are to success. Yeah, weird game, a low-scoring game, but as you mentioned, a win nonetheless. Here's a recap of last week's W over Louisville. If this unit's going to be anything, it's relentless. Can we know that bad things will happen today? Can we just set our minds to respond with our competitive best? Throw the next punch. Today they go for a 22nd consecutive home victory. And here come the Irish. Throws broken up. Kyle Hamilton. <laughs> Two scoring drives, both ending with a field goal. So at halftime, Notre Dame leading Louisville 6 to nothing. Listen, everybody understands what we need to do and how to do it. But the fact of the matter is, we've got to crank it up. We're in a dogfight, okay? That team's got life, they believe. So you're in a battle now. But there has to be a tenacity, there's got to be a will, and there's got to be a sense of urgency from every man in this locker room. When we touch this field, we've got 30 minutes left to decide the outcome. Let's go do something about it. Let's go! See what Notre Dame dials up. Looks scrambled. Take off, look! Take off, look! Lower the shoulder. Reach for the pylon. And in for the touchdown! And the Irish are back on top. You got your back. Let's go, D. Downfield, and it is deflected. Just like that. Back to the other side. Look out. Dalen Hayes with the big hit. Notre Dame. Conversions on this drive, and that might seal the fate of this game. I'm here to tell you the truth. You did a lot of really good things today, but you're going to be met with stiff competition when you're one of the top five teams in the country. You got to find ways to win, and we won today. What I was equally proud of is we had some guys step up today. His versatility, his selflessness, one of our leaders on our football team. And he gets the game ball, and that's Sean Crawford. One, two, three, four. Well, my, wasn't that a short highlight film? Hopefully that's the shortest of the year. We take this time in the show to talk to one of the students on campus. So we have Aiden Thomas from The Observer joining us to talk about Pittsburgh's defense. But Aiden, first. How'd you calm down after that win last week? What'd you do, man? <laughs> I had to, you know, I had to take a little walk around campus after not seeing the uh, the deep passes that I was so confidently predicting on here last week. I was I was ready to watch it go in there and watch us drop forty on Louisville, and I had to walk out and just at four zero, number three in the nation, just move on to move on to Pitt. Well, let's talk about being in the stadium, though. A lot of people watching are not able to go this year. What was the feeling like in the stadium during the game? Uh, well, at the beginning, it was exciting. It was electric, kind of as it's, it's been pretty electric. Uh, as the game went on, I'd say it got a little bit more anxious as Notre Dame took a little while to get going, really never got the offense going. It was kind of like that weird game, just a lot of slow, long possessions. So I'd say it was possibly a little quieter than some of the home games we've had so far. But still at the beginning, that atmosphere is still definitely there as we're, uh, the student body is really doing uh, their best to create a home field advantage. Well, let's put that win behind us and look towards another one at Pittsburgh. First road game of the year. Talk to me about Patrick Jones, defensive end for the Pittsburgh Panthers defense. Yeah, he's absolutely going to be the X factor for this one uh, for the Pitt defense. Uh, like you said, he has seven sacks. He's eight tackles for loss. He's been he's been a beast most of the time for Pitt, but there's been kind of one caveat in that six of those seven sacks came against Louisville and came against B.C., so in four other games, he's been held to one sack, and I think five of his eight tackles for loss came in those two games as well. So he's been extremely – he's extremely talented, likely a round one draft pick, but he's also been shown that people can limit him, 
And when he's limited, Notre Dame's going to have a little bit more freedom to do what they want offensively. So it will be key that they don't let him get in going, don't let Jones get going, because Pitt does have enough talent that if he's going along with everybody else, it's going to be really hard to get the ball moving against them. A big game for Liam Eikenberg. And Aiden, anytime I can mention a lineman, I got to do it. So I believe in <laughs> Liam, and, and so should you, Notre Dame faithful. Who else on this 4-3 defense for Pittsburgh stands out to you? Absolutely. Well, kind of opposing Jones, you have uh, Rashad Weaver, who has eight tackles for loss and four and a half sacks, which I think is second uh, to Jones on Pitt. And he also has two forced fumbles. So that's uh, two of, I think, five or six turnovers that Pitt has forced this year. And so he's definitely a playmaker. He's going to be um, a guy that, especially if Jones is being shut down by Eichenberg or whoever else uh, he's matching up against on the Notre Dame line. Uh, Weaver's going to be the guy that they're going to rely to try to get to book, to try to stuff Williams and Tyree in the backfield and really prevent uh, the Irish from getting the ball moving and controlling the clock like they did against Louisville. Let's talk about their linebackers. They got Phil Campbell, a guy who when I watch the film, he certainly jumps off. But that linebackers in secondary, they're the weakness of this Pitt Panthers defense, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So they do have uh, – Phil Campbell, he said he's a great player, and Paris Ford is a great player in the secondary. He has three picks on the year. Um, but you are right in that the linebackers in the secondary, definitely more of the weak spot, which is interesting because it's going to match up with the Notre Dame passing game, which hasn't been the strongest suit of their offense so far. One thing Pitt struggled with immensely last week was letting Miami's tight ends run all over the field. And, um, I mean, between Michael Meyer and Tommy Tremble, those are two great pass-catching tight ends. Tremble's a great blocking tight end. And so you've got a couple of playmakers there that can be really good and really helpful in getting this Notre Dame offense going, um, especially after kind of a slower week against Louisville. Well, maybe I can get you a shout out in the broadcast if the tight ends start having a day, so you'll have to listen to the radio call. <laughs> And lastly, our favorite part of getting to talk each week, put on your offensive coordinator hat, Aiden. What kind of plays do you want to see this week? Uh, absolutely. So I'm going to I'm gonna keep it pretty simple this week. I want them to pull a lot of those counter plays, and I want them to go away from Patrick Jones. The counter plays we saw were super successful against Florida State, and I don't want to be bold and predict deep passes again because that, that uh, bit me last week. So if they can pull some of those counter plays, get Tremble in the game as a lead blocker, and then start having Williams and Tyree just absolutely explode out of the backfield, establishing the run game has been key for the offense so far, and doing that again is going to be critical. And if they start running those counter plays with success, that might open up some play action options where you can start getting Tremble and some of those receivers into the game later on. He is Aiden Thomas from The Observer. Thanks as always, Aiden. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. And now let's get to Coach Kelly and what he has to say about the first road game for your Irish. I pay strict attention to the protocol and procedures and, and our travel. Um, spent a lot of time leading up to uh, – you know, this pit trip, you know, so we've done a lot of work even while we're at home here over the last couple of weeks with this trip itself. So I think if I was just now starting to wrap my, you know, head around this trip to pit, I might be a little bit overwhelmed, but we've been working on it now for a good 10 days to two weeks in terms of, you know, how we're putting this together. And as I mentioned, we've got a great support staff that is, uh, spent a lot of time advancing this and putting it together. So I, I feel pretty good where we are, which allows me uh, to focus on the preparation of our football team, our coaches uh, and players, and, and getting them ready for a really good football team. And Pitt, you know, Pitt's, look, Pat Narduzzi coach football team is, is tough. It's rugged. They're, 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 they're always going to play uh, Notre Dame hard. Um, and, and, and they've got some game wreckers on defense, <laughs> quite frankly. You know, they, they're going to get after the quarterback. Um, they're going to play physical, and uh, they're well coached. They also play great special teams. They, they've, they've kept themselves and, and won some games because of special teams. So well coached, tough, physical. Uh, they've got some game wreckers on defense. Uh, that'll keep you up at night. By that way, with that win over Louisville, um, Brian Kelly, number three all time in program history, surpassing the legendary era Parsesian. So those are some serious names that he's going through right now. Let's bring in from the Notre Dame Observer. We meet with her every week to talk about the opposing team's offense, Charlotte Edmonds, who joins us now on Here Come the Irish. Charlotte, how are you? 
I'm doing well. I have to admit, this whole segment's taken me down a little trip of memory lane. Um, when Ryan was talking about that UCLA game, that was my first game in Notre Dame Stadium. And I remember Jeff Samarja's touchdown so vividly. And oh, my goodness. How old were you? I was eight at the time. So wow. I had complained the whole game. And then that was a great way to end things. So yeah. really when, you were, to me. Were, when you were an eight-year-old, did you know that you wanted to go to Notre Dame? I think I, I naively thought Notre Dame was the only school. My dad had kind of successfully brainwashed us at that point. That's how it works. Don't you understand? That's how it operates. My mom never stood a chance in that regard. But yeah, so, and then on, on that same note, Pitt, talk, you, you'd be hard pressed to find a Notre Dame fan who doesn't get a little PTSD when Pitt comes around. I mean, 2012, I think about how closely they almost ended. All it took was a field goal to go their way. And yeah. Nash, our undefeated regular season would be out the way. So, um, yeah, definitely this brings up this weekend always brings up a lot of that tradition that you find in Notre Dame's traditional season. There have been a couple pit heartbreakers in Notre Dame history. I don't, I can't remember. Was that who was the left handed pit quarterback that just drove me crazy that just went up and down the field on Notre Dame? I can't remember the year, but I remember specific games against Pitt. Never. Never underestimate the Pitt Panthers. And with that, um, how would you describe their offense? They um, they got a quarterback who likes to chuck it around a little bit. They are no question pass first offense, and he's a very prolific thrower. So Kenny Pickett, he actually reminds me a little bit of Ian Book um, and a little bit more dependent on his arm, but a three-year starter. He's a senior. He's experienced. He's been in this position before, um, but definitely relies likes to keep the ball in the air. So far, he's thrown over 300 yards in all six games of their season, five games, I believe, that he's played in. He missed one game, but um, including 411 and a one-point loss to NC State. So this will come down to the secondary. That said, he is also Pitt's second-leading rusher. So it's not to say you can't, you can't give him too much space because especially when you're talking about short yardage, trying to convert on third downs, he can make you pay on that. Um, yeah, so definitely this – I think there's one quote that – I was thinking of from last week's game that Dalen Hayes talked about, which is really indicative of thinking what this game will come down to. He said, we don't expect anything of the offense. We asked him to go put three points on the, on the board and then we can keep the other team from scoring. And this it will absolutely be what this comes down to because this, this team has the ability to really put a lot of pressure on the Notre Dame defense. Yeah, I appreciate uh, Dalen's comments, but I'm sure at some point the off, the offense will want to score some points. <laughs> the, defense yeah, will breathe not um, uh, the, the pit running game, all right, so they, they rely a lot on Kenny Pickett's arm, but um, can they run it when they have to? Yes, Vincent Davis is their leading rusher, and he definitely has – um, I believe he's a redshirt senior, so he's been around. He um, definitely has that potential. But going back to that run game or that passing game, their five biggest or their five leading receivers in terms of yards per game average more yards per game than our leading receiver, being Tommy Trim or no, uh, this one's Javon McKinley, which might be a, more of a commentary on Notre Dame's offense as opposed to Pitt's offense, but. There's no question Vincent Davis will give them some different looks, particularly probably in short yardage, red zone offense. But this will come down to the secondary versus those five big targets. The foremost being Addison Jordan, a, a true freshman. He already He's averaging almost 75 yards per game. He's had three touchdowns this season and will likely be Kenny Pickett's favorite target throughout this game. Charlotte, I'm looking at Pitt's schedule. The last three games have been three losses, but they could easily be five and one, if not six. And oh, they lost to NC State by a point. They lost to BC by a point. They were in that game against Miami before losing 31-19. This is what made me worry about Louisville last week, because I thought their record was better, their team was better than the record indicated. And I feel the same way about Pitt, to be honest with you. I completely agree. I think this might be the first time in a while that the ACC really is kind of living up to the hype and if anything exceeding there's some good teams that are that may not be representing that in their record and I think Pitt has all that potential um if you look at their see at their schedule they haven't put up you know they're averaging you know 20 30 points here at at these various games but they're getting in the red zone so they're getting opportunities and 
they have all the pieces there to be a serious threat to Notre Dame season. All right, listen, I'm going to be on campus next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for Notre Dame Day, which starts Monday night. And I, I don't make many demands, but I demand premier South Bend fall weather. If you can make that happen. I'll do, I'll do my best. I'll talk to the people in charge. Please do. Like that. <laughs> make it happen, Charlotte. And maybe I'll bring you some other decorations for the background there. We'll make it work by the okay. end of the day. Sounds good. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, now we're going to listen to head coach Pat Narduzzi of the Pitt Panthers, his thoughts on the fight in Irish. Well, we faced a great Notre Dame team, number three in the country, coming into our house, uh, coming to Pittsburgh. We know it's always been a good game. Uh, it's a game our kids will look forward to. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're talented across the board. You know, I'll talk offensively, defensively. Haven't watched a lot of special teams at this point. Um, but they are big, strong, and physical. Uh, a typical Notre Dame football team. Um, you know, they base offensively out of two tight ends. They're going to put their two tight ends in. The Trumbull kid, number 24, is a physical great blocker, their starter. Um, you know, but really they got three tight ends that, that uh, do a lot of work in there. Obviously run by Ian Book and old Tommy Reese, the old former quarterback uh, that I faced several times in the past as their offensive coordinator and has really done a nice job, you know, putting things together over on offense and, you know, got them to their 4-0, you know, number three ranking. Defensively, Clark Lee. Uh, an old, old ACC uh, linebacker coach at Syracuse does a nice job. He's a, you know base out of a four three, and again up front they're just very sound across the board. Their safeties are active in the run game like our safeties are, so they make a lot of tackles. And um, you know we're gonna have to we're gonna have to play our best to, to get a W on Saturday. Well, there he is, and he's talking about our Irish. And I'll tell you something: it's funny to hear him talk about a big, tough, physical Irish team because that's exactly who they are. And it's funny, since we're going to be playing in Pittsburgh, why don't we bring up a former Steeler? He was the quarterback of Notre Dame in 1969. He was on the cover of Time Magazine while he was at Notre Dame. Please welcome Terry Henretti. Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. Great to be here. And I'm sort of really liking on that sweatshirt you got there, man. I haven't seen one like that before. Hey, you're the man. We'll see if we can, we can get around an offensive lineman. You know, my hey, absolutely. Lineman in Notre Dame. They always took care of me from high school to college to the pros. So you, you're, you guys are the man. That's, I know you were a good quarterback already because every good quarterback knows and loves their linemen. And great to see you. I know you battled COVID earlier. What was that like to get over? That was an interesting time. You know, at the time I thought it was uh, just regular flu. But then all of a sudden it started to keep progressing. And, and uh, luckily I have a great doctor here. She put me on the hydroxychloroquine right away. And I was in a hospital for about five days. I've lost, I lost a lot of weight, but it was, you know, it was sort of a, a, a good omen. It's hard to say that, but uh, I got down to my high school weight and I feel great. And, you know, right now probably feel as good as I've felt in an awful long time. So that's, that's great. Well, we look forward to those photos of you and your high school speedo, man. It'll be great to be on the Camera Time magazine again. What was oh, it like? Long gone, man. Long gone. <laughs> What was it like to be on the cover of Time Magazine, such a major publication during your days at Notre Dame and still today? It was it was embarrassing, to be honest with you, because Notre Dame and ERA and their coaching staff didn't want us on the on the cover. And the Time Magazine wanted to put Jimmy and I on it, Seymour, my receiver. And, uh, you know, we had so many great other upperclassmen. You know, we had Larry Conjure, Nick Eddy, George Gedeke. You know, you go on Alan Page and Pete Duranko and all these Jimmy Lynch and you know, those are the guys that really deserve to be on the cover. But, you know, they like the, the pretty guys, right? <laughs> so, but they couldn't, Notre Dame would not give them a picture. They had to use a painting of a picture in order to get it on the magazine. Little known, oh, right? It's, and we'll yeah, it Aaron's, right here. Aaron was trying to shut down your uh, money making early. Huh? He didn't want you to have too many girlfriends and focus on the game. I'm not sure he was wrong. You know, but you went from Notre Dame and then played. We share the Pittsburgh Steelers in our history. You were a second-round pick for the legendary coach Chuck Knoll. Tell us a story about your time with Chuck Knoll as a Pittsburgh Steeler and a two-time Super Bowl champion. Well, first of all, I'm, my hometown is only 30 miles from Pittsburgh. You know, Butler, Pennsylvania, right up the road, north north of Pittsburgh. So it was fun to come back home, you know. And uh, I was uh, – Chuck Knoll was a rookie coach. I was a rookie coach quarterback and you know Joe Green was the first pick that year I was the second pick I did all right in the first round uh -huh. and uh but it was it was interesting because we were we we won our opening game you know we played in the old Pitt Stadium which was really just the worst field in the world well before Three Rivers or 
or as you were mentioning earlier, Hinesfield. And uh, so, I mean, we we beat the we uh, played the Lions the first game. We won that, and we <laughs> proceeded to lose thirteen straight. But I have I have something in. in Probably no one else has ever done. I have the I, my rookie year. We were one and thirteen with the Steelers. I played on Super Bowl nine and Super Bowl ten. Then my last year was with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We were zero and fourteen. So I had the two worst records ever, and wedged in with two Super Bowls. So try to figure if anybody ever did that one. Yeah, we lost fourteen games in a row when I was in Houston one year. We went two and fourteen. I'm glad you're still alive, man. Those are tough times for a football player. And I'll never forget going to Latrobe for training camp. And there the original Mr. Rooney had his cherry wood cigar case all encased and protected. And I thought after a couple of good days of training camp, I'm going to go check it out. Well, then Mr. Rooney, I went and looked. It's full of Swisher sweets, a cherry wood box with Swisher sweets. Did you ever have any good cigars with Mr. Rooney and Chuck Noll? I never did, but Bradshaw loved going down there to Mr. Rooney's office and stealing the cigars. You know, Chuck was not a cigar smoker. So he was yeah. the wine connoisseur of the group, and uh, all right, it, it was in, uh, that was a great order. I mean, coming from Notre Dame and, and playing for the Steelers, you know, there's a lot of like it's a lot of family atmosphere, and, and it was just you know an outstanding up you know place to play my pro career, and obviously Notre Dame was you know the number one choice of my life, so that was it. You and me both, my friend. Well, a lot of our viewers. Uh, support Notre Dame in many ways. And, and I just always like to remind them of how much Notre Dame changes former players' lives. How did Notre Dame change your life? Well, I think it gave you a real recognition. I think you I think you really go through life. You know, I worked on Wall Street for 30 years, and I was never hired by a Notre Dame person in, on Wall Street, but uh, the respect that everybody had for the university, I mean, the, the outreach that it has, I mean, people really enjoyed, you know, being around Notre Dame people. And it opens a lot of doors. I mean, it's it's uh, it's truly what it was meant to be when you first said, you know, once you're at Notre Dame, you know, you're going to have all these doors open for you. And they really did. So it was uh, – I made the decision after I first met Era in my when I was about 17 years old, and it was the best decision in my life. It was, you know, forever. Well, we are so grateful that you came to Notre Dame, an amazing life you've had after football, not only – as you mentioned, 30 years as a stockbroker, but you helped coach your daughter Claire's team to a softball championship. That must have been awesome. It was a 10 year old team. And uh, it's the first time that the, the town has ever done it. I mean, that's the winning, winning. I, you know, I coached football, basketball, baseball for my son. I coached basketball and softball for my daughter. And it's the, the most dominating team I ever had was my 10 year old girls softball team. And we won the state championship. It was, you know, it, it was, it was fun. It was really was great to be around all the kids. They're never too young to learn how to win. Well, thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate it greatly. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Take care now. Next, let's get to where you, the viewers, get a chance to beat Vic Lombardi with Vic's picks. Vic, take it away. Ryan, I'm going to do my darndest to give one of these away this week. All right, do not want a free sweatshirt. I mean, you have to beg me to give you a free sweatshirt. Is it really that difficult to take one of these for free? All you have to do is beat me in our weekly VIX picks segment, which shouldn't be that hard. I try to make it easy on you. Last week, unfortunately, we had no winners. And um, I look back at you know my guesses, and I'm, I made my guesses. I always, I always underrate. I, get, I should say overrate the opponent and give them a lot of love and fluff because you never know how things end up. So here's how it works. For those of you who understand, you have four things you got to decide. Will Notre Dame win or lose the game? Will Notre Dame cover the spread? Yes or no. And the spread this week is 10 and a half. Notre Dame favored. How many total yards of offense? And that's what really tripped up a lot of people last week. And then, of course, the final score, that one is just for fun. So we'll go down the list, uh, Vix Picks, and we'll lead things off representing the Jesse Harper Council from Plano, Texas. James McGarry joins us. James, do you want a free sweatshirt, my friend? Absolutely. You want me to give you my address now? Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. You, you got this down. Well, let's not even waste time. You think Notre Dame's going to win, obviously. I do think they're going to win. Okay. Um, I don't think they're going to cover because I think it's going to be a low scoring game. Uh, two good defenses, backup quarterback for Pitt. And with all the distractions this fall and this being the first road trip, 
uh, thinking of a slow starting sloppy first half. So I don't think they're going to cover. See, I, I love everything you have on the board there because it's very similar to my picks, which are coming up a little bit later. A win is a win. It doesn't have to be fabulous. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Absolutely. You get out of Dodge with a W. And I think we were a little spoiled those first couple games. The offense came easy, right? It was so easy, gaping holes everywhere. Football is not supposed to be that easy. And this is obviously the best team they're going to play so far. Pitt's yeah. surprisingly 3-3, three and three, I think, is their record. But I, yeah. they were projected to be a lot better. And their defense is, is pretty good, pretty solid. James, I like it, buddy. Good luck to you. Hope you win one. Thank you, sir. Take care. Up next, from the Kavanaugh Council, uh, Chris Grand Prix, 1988. Chris, did I pronounce that properly? You got it right, Vic. You can never have enough Notre Dame apparel, so I look forward to a sweatshirt. Good for you. That's I like the one you're wearing right now. Where are you uh, broadcasting from right now? Are you on your patio? I am in my home office in Richmond, Virginia. Beautiful. Okay. Um, you graduated in 88. I got to school there in 88. What dorm were you in? I was in Howard Hall, which dates myself since yeah. at the end of my junior year, it was converted to a girls' dorm. Yeah. I was hoping my daughter would wind up in Howard well, what Hall. Was, by the way, how was the, what was the reaction on campus when that happened? Because I'm sure a lot of you were very comfortable at Howard at the time. And we loved Howard. And, yeah. and as much as we all would like to have stayed while yeah. it was converted to a female, they, they didn't let that happen. So yeah. it actually allowed me, I was a rising senior most of my friends were planning on staying in Howard as a senior, and it was frankly the only way my parents at the time would have let me live off campus. So we picked up Howard Hall, we moved it to Campus View Apartments, and we had a, <laughs> we had a good senior year. Oh, Campus View Apartments. I remember the parties there. Thank you very much for that stroll down memory lane. All right, Chris, so what do you got for us here? Uh, well, I will. I think while, while Notre Dame struggled a bit last week, I think they begin to get the offense back on track score a few more points through the passing game. So I've got Notre Dame winning 27-13 and covering the spread. All right. So 27-13, it won't be a total blowout, but 380 yards of offense. What did you think about that game last week against Louisville? Are you a little scared? Yeah, it was, you know, I think that the defense played so well that I just kept waiting for the offense to get on track. They moved it up and down. They, they obviously struggled in the red zone. So I'm sure it was a focus in practice this week and, you know, I think it's a strength on strength matchup in terms of our running game against Pitt's running defense. But hopefully, well, that if they they crowd the box, we'll be able to get the tight ends and get the receivers into a little more action this week. Chris, thank you. Shout out to the Campus View Apartments, by the way. All right, thanks, Vic. Take care. Up next from the Soren Society, Cornelius Neal Brown, class of '75. Cornelius, do you want me to call you Neal or Cornelius? Give me give me an option here. You can call me. Either, but if you call me corny, there'll be a fight. Okay, Beautiful. That, that, I like that. that. Well, Neil, everybody calls me generally. Well, you are the best dressed guest we've ever had on this show, just so you know. Wonderful. Well, you. Uh, <laughs> where, mean, I was in downtown Chicago. Oh, okay. That, that explains it. Where did you live when you were at Notre Dame? I was in Zom Hall. I was Zom. part of the last all-male entering class at Notre Dame in 1971. Yeah. Uh, my so, senior wait. year. We played Zom in Interhall football and won a hard-fought game, I believe, seven to six. That's all I remember about Zom. You were Man, in Soren. Yeah. Soren Hall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're the five quarters. We, we North Quarters. We didn't care for yeah. who wasn't in the North Quad. Okay. <laughs> the North Quad was like a different world for me. I remember walking over going, this is far. Now it's just I – mean, the, the campus is so much bigger now. It, it, it's amazing how much things have changed. It is incredible. And I still remember my freshman year, the, uh, the the upperclassmen, our first day, my very first day, they came into our room, handed us a copy of the fight song and said, memorize it. You're going to have to sing it at the North Dying Hall tonight. And then as they left, they turned and said, and now that you're at Notre Dame, you should know we never lose. <laughs> we run out of time now and then, but we never lose. And I, I, I never realized, but... That uh, never give up attitude. Yeah, it, that's it, great to hear. Everything beyond football. Yeah, and that's what school taught me. You're right. You're right. You take that to real life. All right, my friend. Uh, let's go through your picks here. Who do you like this week, and why, and how? I think uh, uh, Chris gave uh, predictions very similar to mine. Okay. Uh, Pitt's always tough, but I, I, I think the team comes out stronger because they lost. 
or, or not lost, but they played poorly against yeah. Louisville. And I, they, the offense has to step it up. And if they don't step it up, uh, it's going to be problems down the road. And I think this is the game that they step it up in. I think they play hard. I think Book starts connecting on his passes. Yeah. Uh, because he's going to have to, because the running game cannot carry the team. Yeah. The, Neil, the, did you watch that Louisville game the way I did? I, I always measure every game. I know you're not supposed to do this, but we as fans, we can get away with it. I'm always looking at the Notre Dame game. Well, how – how are they going to make this work against Clemson? And when Clemson's scoring 190 points in a game, you keep wondering that same thing. Did you look watch a game that way? Uh, yeah, actually, and and I also watched the game the way I, I I heard that you do, which is by myself. Darn right. I I and my wife came down to tell me something, uh, and I said, "This is not the time to talk to me right now." And, and <laughs> she should know that we've been married for 37 years. Still, sometimes there's a reminder that's necessary. So. But uh, no, I all I could think about was, you know, I, I don't want to get spanked by Clemson again. I, yeah. I don't. OK, and yeah. I think we've got a team that can play very well and do yeah. very well this year. And I'm tired of having to harken back to 73 when my my year there was a national championship year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was that was a special year. Well, Neil, we have a lot of time to talk about that Clemson game. That's a couple weeks down the line. <laughs> hey, buddy, thank you very much for your pick. Good luck. Hope you win a sweatshirt. Okay, thank you. You, you. Good luck to you as well, sir. Take care. All right. Uh, representing the Rockney Athletics Fund, class of 94, is Chris Martin. Chris Martin, come on down. You're on. Here come the Irish. How you doing, buddy? Okay, great. Thanks. How you doing? I'm great. I can't complain. You look fresh down there. What uh, – what dorm did you live in when you were at uh, Notre Dame? Dillon Hall. Oh, you were a Dillon guy. I had a bunch of buddies in Dillon. You know, I, I was off campus because I transferred in. And so we started off campus. And some of my off-campus buddies went to Dillon. I went to Soren. But I remain fast friends with a lot of those Dillon guys. Love Dillon. That's a great okay. that's a great dorm. Uh, all right, buddy, who do you like here and why? All right, well, like Notre Dame to win, but I, I sound like everyone's sort of the same boat. Uh, very close to spread. I don't think we'll cover the spread. I think it's going to be a 23-14 score. Um, but I think as Neil's talking about, if we don't get the passing game going, I think Irish need to be an upset alert. They need to be able to pass the ball uh, to get around Pittsburgh's defense because they can stop the run and they can definitely get to the quarterback. Um, I think that's like 29 sacks in six games already. So they know how to get to the QB. And it's not like they just teed off an Austin P. It's pretty consistent through the six games they've played so far this uh, season. Um, from a yardage perspective, I'm looking at 325. Um, pretty close to like what the three teams averaged. Uh, the three teams that beat Pittsburgh the last three games, uh, just over 300 um, yards. How often do you get up for games? I know this year is different, but uh, you're pretty uh, standard watcher up in uh, South Bend, or do you stay home? No, I get up every few seasons. I actually went up last season for the SC game. Uh, when I went with my, with my good buddies, who's never been in their name before. So for him, I said, well, you're going to SC then. Um, it was great experience and having been in South Bend for a game in October since 93, um, toward the end of the game, I was shaking and I wasn't sure if it was because I was cold or because I was just really nervous because SC was driving again. And just sort of like reminisce like what it felt like as a student, whereas toward the end of the game, it's really close, it's nail biting. Um, it, it felt very much like I had never left. It was really neat going back to campus. Isn't that crazy? I had the same I, – I go back often for games. I have the same feeling too. I mean, you're sitting there going, oh, yeah, I remember this. I remember it now. There's nothing like it. Chris, thanks, bud. Good luck to you. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. All right. Let's go to uh, the uh, John Cardinal O'Hara Society. John uh, – Alan Jolly. Alan Jolly from uh, Carmel, Indiana. Hey, Alan, how you doing, bud? I'm fine. How are you? Good to see you. I like that pullover. That's cool. That's a good. So where are you broadcasting from? Is that your Notre Dame room? Uh, it's my home office, which pretty yeah. soon hopefully will be my retiree office. So uh, that's my home office. All right. Tell us about your, your Notre Dame experience. Well, I uh, wanted to go to Notre Dame when I got out of high school a uh, long, long, long time ago. I just didn't have the money to do it. So uh, about, I don't know, 35 years later, I had a chance to go to Notre Dame uh, through the executive MBA program. So dreams do come true if sometimes they're just a little delayed. So that is so cool. How old were you when you were there? Well, uh, let's see. I think I was about 50. Wow. 
And, and what was that like? I mean, you had to be the oldest guy in your class. I did. My, I brought up the average <laughs> in the classroom <laughs> age. But it was good because I have twin daughters. And at the time, they were in school also. At Notre so, Dame? Uh, no, they were in high school. Oh, okay. Maybe even grammar school. So dad did his homework and um, they did theirs. So it's probably a good experience to show lifelong learning. And that, you know, one day if you work hard, the stars line up and you get to know the to Notre Dame, which I love since since high school. So took a roundabout way, but I got there. Alan, that's like a delayed Rudy story. I love it. I love it. Let's make a movie. <laughs> let's make a movie. First, let's get your picks. Who do you like this week? I got to go with my heart. So I'm going to pick the Fighting Irish. Okay. You didn't say that didn't sound too convincing when you say you got a close game there, too. I do. Uh, well, last week, um, last again, Louisville, that was a tough one. Um, you know, and, but I, I watched also some of the Alabama and the SEC games. Yeah. And we got to step it up if we're going to be able to compete with those schools. Yeah. But uh, I think we'll take them. Pitt always plays hard against us. Um, I remember when I was in school, I went to every game, and whenever Pitt showed up, it seemed like it was going to be a long afternoon. But I think we're going to prevail. I think it's going to be a good year. Alan, I'm too lazy to look it up right now. The lefty quarterback who maybe a decade ago I, I saw, who was the lefty quarterback that went up and down the field against Notre Dame and beat the Irish that year? If anybody watching can remember and identify, I think it started with a P. And I just remember him throwing darts. And every time I think of Pitt, I think of that game. So you're right, though. Pitt always concerns me. Hey, we got your picks. Best of luck. Love your story. Great. Thank you. Go Irish. Take care, Alan. All right. We're going to go now to the congregation of Holy Cross, Reverend Eric Schimmel. Reverend, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, my goodness. You got a terrible towel. You must be from Pittsburgh. I am from Pittsburgh. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Although I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, I grew up a, uh, a diehard Penn State fan, so it's okay to cheer against Pitt. Did you really? Wow, what I a did. conflict of interest over there. Well, I <laughs> grandfather and great-grandfather went to Penn State, so you know we, we're a little minority in the neighborhood, but that's okay. Um, how would you describe Pittsburgh, PA, to folks who've never been there? Because I agree with Ryan Harris. When you come through that tunnel and you see that city, it's nothing that you expect. It's like, wow, it's eye-popping. It is. Uh, and I, I've joked with some people that I grew up in the Holy Land, you know, from a Christian perspective, three rivers, one city, very Trinitarian. So, you know, um, but blue collar town, but you know, means that the people are, are just willing to help you out. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they had some interesting phrases and accents, um, but I'm not going to imitate things now. But, you know, learn when I... Uh, left Pittsburgh, came out to Notre Dame, that most people call them rubber bands rather than gum bands and things like that. <laughs> Every community has its own language. All right, Reverend, who do you like this week? I think the Irish are going to win, but they're not going to cover the spread. Uh, I, I think they're going to realize if they want to play on Sunday, you got to play well in a place like Heinz Field, but Pitt's also going to be charged up for them. Um a couple big plays will, will rack up the yardage for us, but I think it's going to be a slog. Very nice. And I agree with you. Big plays. We haven't seen enough big plays. We've seen them in the running game. We need to see them in the passing game. Right. This season. Uh, Reverend, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank you. God All right. Uh, we're going to move on now to, let's see, who's available from the congregation. Oh, no, we just did, did Eric Schimmel. Look, I guess John Savey. John Savey from the President's Circle, class of 91. John, class of 91 right here, baby. How you doing? Doing good, Vic. How you doing? Very good. Thank you. Gosh, I, I, I don't know if we met each other when we were in school. I, I graduated the same year. I, it's not a big school, but where did you live? I lived in Morrissey. Oh, man. I knew so yeah. Morrissey. You ever go to Bridget and see the Freddie Jones band? Oh, my goodness. We lived at Bridget's. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I was the bass player in the Freddie Jones band. You were? I was. Are you kidding me? I am not. Oh, that is that's phenomenal. <laughs> what a story. So, yeah. for Bridget's, does Bridget still exist? It does not. It's gone. When did it go away? Uh, you know, when they built all those new condos and, and apartments and everything that are sitting out there. On the Irish, yeah. Irish, I, think, I think, you know, probably. Oh, right, because. They, they yeah. just took them all. They raised it's it all. Yeah, it's all gone. Is linebacker lounge still there? 
I believe. The, yeah, the linebacker's still there because that's that was off to the uh, off to the east. Linebacker's still there. Man, I'm right now. My my brain. I'm rushing through all the memories. That's crazy. I, you you should have been there more often. You should have provided a photo. I wanted to see a before and after of you and the band. Right there? Now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, think ahead here, my friend. All right, John. Who do you like? Uh, I'm taking the Irish in a close one. I mean, I they, they've been uh, they've been grinding this year, and this is their first real road game. Uh, so I think it's going to be a, a tough slog. But I think at the end of the day, they're going to figure out how to pull it out, like they've done all year so far. Do you make it up for games? I do. I make it out at least to uh, to one every year. My daughter is actually a senior this year, so I've been making it out for sure for the last like four or five years. How has she responded to to all this uh, COVID related stuff? Has it been a tough year for her? It, it has been a tough year. Yeah, she was actually uh, international study student in London yeah. the spring semester last year, and so she got her her program shortened and and had to come home uh, early from the spring, and then obviously. She was very excited to go back to school this year, but it's obviously not been a very uh, a very fun year. You know, right. she's had as much fun as you can have, but uh, but they're definitely locked down. It's yeah. not as fun as it should be. It is what it is. You got to face adversity at some point. John, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, go Irish. Take care. Okay, we skipped this fella earlier, but now we got him back on the line from the Order of Saint Thomas. More. It is Matthew Heflin. Matthew. Hey, is it Hoffman or Heflin? It's Hoefling. It's a long O. We'll let that one slide, though. So. Hoefling. Man, see, if I don't get these pronunciation guides, I'm terrible. Where yeah. are you uh, Where are you joining us from there? I'm from uh, sunny Charlotte, North Carolina, down here in the south. Oh, beautiful. Are you in your patio here? A little patio, a little evening patio. I had Sports Center on in the background. And, uh, nice. On you tonight, yeah. Do you make it up for games at all? I do. I have a I have a freshman there this year, so we were hoping to come to the Clemson game. I actually hadn't canceled my flight let yet. If you can pull some strings on on somehow getting me into that one, but uh, we do try to make it to a game or two a year. Love you know, it's, it's funny you say that. Uh, last week I ran into a couple of Clemson guys uh, here in Denver, and they were bent on going to that Notre Dame Clemson game this year. And it seems like their life is ruined because they can no longer do it. You know, and, and we fail to understand how many people, how many schedules were just ruined by COVID because you make up your entire year on going to games like this. Absolutely. Not only the hotels and the flights, I had a lot of family and friends from this area that were looking to trek up there. And we we're hoping for some cold weather, still are, for the for the Clemson Tigers. I don't know if yeah. they can pull it like, the, like Notre Dameers. I love that shirt, by the way. Very well done. Okay, uh, let's get your picks here, Matthew. Sure thing. Uh, I got them bouncing back. I, I thought last week, um, you know, something about the offense just wasn't clicking. I, I have a feeling Brian Kelly's got them working hard this week. I think they're going to go open it up a little bit with Lindsey and Austin. I like them scoring some points this week. So I had them, uh, I had them 31, 17 and covering, uh, even though I agree with your prior guess, I do think Pitt's always a challenge. I just, I'd like, I think the offense finally clicks this week. That's my thought. Let's hope so, and I'm with you on that. I'd love to see Austin on a go route to start the game. Let's just go. Send him down the sideline and launch it up there and get on the board. It worked for Alabama against Georgia. When I saw that, I thought, why don't we do that? So I yeah. did. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate take, it. Take care. Go Irish. All right, take care. And now i got to give everyone my picks. And listen, I'm hoping I, I lose, all right? I want you to have this free sweatshirt. So don't, uh, don't consider this a threat. But if nobody wins this week, we might as well just turn this segment off. I mean, come on. Here are my picks, Notre Dame versus Pitt. And like most of the people that join me, Pitt's one of those teams, right? When, when you go through the tradition and the lore of Notre Dame football, every year they play, there's a Pitt team that's just anxious to play Notre Dame, and they give them a fight every single time. Do I think the Irish will win? Yes. Do I think it's going to be a close game? Of course I do. I don't think they're going to beat the spread. But that 28-20, it'll be one of those 28-15, 28-20. 17 games that becomes closer later in the game. I don't think they'll hit 400 yards, but what I want to see this week are explosion plays. I want to see the offense open it up a little bit. Just give us a taste of what they can do. And and in the end, I think you are what you are and you are what your opponent allows you to be. I think Notre Dame is one of those teams that sort of plays at that level. Not to say they cannot play at Clemson's level. We have plenty of time to get there, but you just watch. They will increase their play given the opponent. All right, that'll do it. Right now, I want, to, I want you to see this video. I saw this online a few weeks ago, and I thought it was fantastic. You want to know how Notre Dame recruits with the best of them in the country, how they get the top-notch recruits? 
Take a look at this facilities video they produced. How nice is that facility? I don't know about you, but my eyes stopped on the uh, smoothie section. When they were making smoothies for the players, I'd be living there. Hey, man, it was a, it was amazing. We actually, I transitioned in our junior year. We got to get into that building. And, you know, it, it's crazy how much space there is. And also in that lounge room, how, how awesome that is for players. Because a lot of players, you, you end school at 1230 or 1, and you got about an hour until so you got to be in the building. Well, now you can come in. Get some, get some tape early, relax there in the facility. And I love, too, how they said, hey, the stadium locker room's for game day. This one's for every day. And thank you to everybody who helped support Notre Dame to create those amazing facilities. It's all like, because of you. And I like to tell people, Ryan, that, oh, well, there, there are those who say that's gluttonous. That's over the top. You have to understand something. The recruiting battle is a game in its own. Other schools are, are up, upping their game. If you don't compete at that level, you're going to lose out on kids. And that's, that's, that's the whole deal right there. Period. And, and the big thing, too, just look at Oregon. They have, they have a double-decker locker room. They have two floors yeah. to their locker room and a huge, expansive situation there. And all, everybody, Alabama's locker room's insane. Even yeah. here where we live in Colorado, CU just made a huge – at the largest cold tub in America. So things like that matter to kids when they're getting recruited. And, and we laugh, but we forget a lot of these recruits are 17 years old. What would you have been swayed by at 17? You know, and, and all the flash and glitz and seeing yourself taking a nap in a soundproof room with a bunch of doctors and an awesome locker room, you want a part of that. The smoothies.
You give me the smoothies, I'm in. All right, Ryan. <laughs> uh, before we say goodbye, let's let's get your uh, your pick this week. Can can Notre Dame bounce back offensively? What's it going to take to get this offense going? Yes, they can, and I believe they will, especially because of the inside running game. They're going to rely on Kyron Williams again, but Ian Book has to take off now. This is about the time where you have to start being who you are in football, and we need the Irish to have a concrete passing attack. I thought it was amazing what Charlotte said earlier that five receivers for Pittsburgh have a higher average per game than Javon McKinley. That can't happen on Saturday. Let's yeah. take the fight to the Steel City and beat them. Now, do you force the issue in the passing game, or do you make it come organically? You got to force the issue. And they did that uh, against the University of South Florida, but they really have to create. And one of the things that they do in the NFL is they say to the quarterback, hey, what are your favorite plays? The quarterback says, I like these five plays. Let's run them. They even did that for Kansas City when Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl, they were waiting to run his favorite play until the fourth quarter when Tyreek Hill caught that pass deep, deep. I think it was a 44-yard gain. So those are the things they need to go to Ian Book, say, what do you like this week? Let's start there, but let's also focus on the run. That offensive line is a great safety blanket, but you want to get Ian Book comfortable early. And that also involves him running. Every single game that Ian Book has ran early, that offense has really had a spark. Want to remind everyone, Notre Dame Day, Monday evening, uh, goes into Tuesday night. I will be on campus myself. And if you donate, if you give during Notre Dame Day, you get one of these fancy Notre Dame masks, which I'm told are wildly popular, Ryan. Yes. Why wouldn't you want a Notre Dame mask? Mm -hmm. Let people know. Hey, they, they say you can always tell a Notre Dame graduate. By the first five minutes, they'll tell you in a conversation. Well, now you don't even have to talk to people. Just let them know. Notre Dame is here. Notre Dame is practicing safety. <laughs> My man, fun show. I appreciate it. We're going to say goodbye. For Ryan Harris, I'm Vic Lombardi. We say goodbye with the Notre Dame drumline.